the Grand Prix year of 1982 began in South Africa, where Johannesburg has recently grown some medium-sized skyscrapers and one very beautiful motor racing circuit about 20 miles out of town. It's called Kyle Army and was just made for cars to go fast on. But for some time they didn't go at all because of a strike. For various reasons there are few strikes in South Africa, but the drivers had brought one with them. Protesting against the terms of their licenses, the drivers, led by DDA Peroni, barricaded themselves into a hotel and refused to come out, leaving their team managers facing the possibility of having to drive the cars personally. Bernie Eggleston, head of the Brabham team and also Mr. Fix of Formula One, wore all his hats simultaneously while having his usual word in somebody's ear. But the all-powerful Jean-Marie Balestri, evincing his usual charm, remained obdurate. Any comment, Mr. Balestri? Practice was cancelled. Except for the odd bit of pushing them backwards and forwards to see if the wheel still works, the cars just sat there with patient mechanics putting funny signs on them. There would have been time to do proper illuminated manuscripts if they'd had the parchment and gold leaf. Not much moved in the pit area, except the usual young idealist dreaming of a chivalrous sport in which shining knights of the road joust with no thought of gain. Bernie went on having a word in somebody's ear, and eventually somebody realized that the waiting world wasn't interested in watching the cars stay still. Mr. Balestri gave his assurance that if the drivers came out of the hotel with their hands up, they would suffer no harm. They believed him, and out they came. One of them was the new world champion. One of them was an old world champion, back from the fiery furnace. One of them deserved to be world champion, but didn't yet know that he never would be. If he had known, it would probably not have stopped him. He was brave. They were brave men all. They were the idols of millions but only on the understanding that when the day came, they had to race, no matter what. So the engines came to life and the Grand Prix year along with them. The Renaults, Ferraris and Brabham's led away on the warm-up lap, thereby stating the big theme of the season. The turbo cars went fast, especially at altitude, but except for the Ferraris, they tended not to get there. The Cosworth engine cars got there, but tended not to go fast. It was up to the turbos to be more reliable and the Cosworths to go more quickly. It would have been easy for the Cosworth cars to do this if the minimum weight limit had not been set so high by the rules, which somehow always tended to favor the turbo cars, thus inspiring the Cosworth team designers to various wheezes and devices. The cheap wheeze and device for this year was water-cooled brakes. The car plus water got weighed by the scrutineers, and the car minus water started the race, hence lowering the weight and increasing the speed. Nobody believes it to be a good thing that serious designers, most of them grown men, should spend half their time dreaming up ways to bend the rules, but nobody knows how to stop it. Everybody knows it's madness, but it still goes on. The similarities between Formula One and World War One are striking to the detached observer, but no one can stay detached once the green light shines. six turbo cars in the lead, two Renaults, two Ferraris, two Brabhams. They were aided by the altitude, but would probably have been doing the same thing at sea level. The turbo teams looked magisterial, as if they were enjoying one of the big technical advantages which periodically divide the sport into two groups, those who got it and those who haven't. The turbo engine was the biggest thing since the ground effect, since the engine in the back, since the detachable cylinder head, since the inflatable tire. And out in front, even of the other turbos, ran the haughty Renaults, like Hode and Rosewall painted yellow. PK's sick Brabham BMW tried to go through a small hill instead of the long way round by road. For the reigning world champion, it was the portent of a frustrating year. But at the time, it must have seemed only a temporary setback. More philosophical than angry, 
PK took the first of what were destined to be several long walks, but there were still five turbos left at the front. There were four turbos left at the front after Villeneuve's Ferrari turned into a locomotive, but two of them were still the Renaults, with Frost leading our move. The Renaults look very impressive touring around together, like Fangio and Moss, or Flanagan and Allen. But Arnu led Frost after Frost's car turned into a tricycle. His front right wheel went up because his rear left had converted itself into an old wetsuit in a tumble dryer. It gave you some idea of how hard the cars are sprung. Someone should invent independent suspension and give the driver's battered bones a rest. Frost went in for a new wheel, presumably happy in the knowledge that his beloved teammate Arnu was pulling away towards maximum points. Out on some obscure part of the circuit where cameras couldn't reach, Carlos Reutemann in his Cosworth engine Williams inherited second place. The moody Carlos had decided that the turbos were vincible after all. With Carlos, an awful lot depends on his mood. If he feels like winning, he goes like the Argentine Air Force. If he feels unhappy, he fades away like the Argentine Army. Peroni's Ferrari conked out expensively. Frost was back on the track and pulling back what fate had taken away. Frost came right past everybody, giving us all the idea that the Renaults were going to do that every time. The remaining big news was that Nicky Lauda, in his first race back from retirement, had quietly contrived to come forth. But from him, a miracle is the least you expect. So somehow this fact was not sensational, merely satisfactory. It was the turbos that were sensational, and especially the Renaults, and especially Frost, the winner. For ordinary engines, the writing was on the wall, and it was in French. If you were normally aspirated, you were short of breath. Get blown or get lost, that was the message. To rub it home, the Lurstree busted the striking drivers after all. Rio, where a mountain made of sugar rules the glowing skyline. Rio, where the per capita income would buy one cc of petrol for an old Coventry Climax. Rio, where the happy populace dress up every second day to provide fiesta footage for foreign camera crews. Rio, where the bouncing brown breasts of Brazil say an uninhibited hello in a language that even a Grand Prix driver can understand. The circuit is at sea level, like the beaches, but what could stop the turbos now? Through the stunning heat, the turbos once again led away, with the flying Villeneuve out to prove that though his teammate Peroni could lead a strike, he, Villeneuve, could lead a race. The Renaults were up there too, but somehow Keke Rosberg's Cosworth Williams had included itself in the party. Didn't the normally aspirated Rosberg know that he was supposed to be obsolete? PK was also much in evidence, moving at a speed that was not supposed to be in the script, moving even faster than Rosberg. 
Having lifted the turbo BMW out of his Brabham and replaced it with a D Mark Ball Cosworth, he too was up there where he shouldn't be, temporarily accompanied by his teammate Petrezzi. Two Brabhams selling twice as much Parmalat sliced ham to the watching millions. But for the moment, it didn't matter whether people were changing one kind of engine for another or running the car with a different kind of engine at each end, because Villeneuve was out in front showing what sheer brilliance can do. He reminded you of a long line of Ferrari drivers whom the public paid to see go faster than anyone else, some of them for year after year, like Ascari, some of them for only a few laps, like Castellotti, who in the Mille Miglia used to drive on the footpath because the road was full of Italian spectators. and Rosberg's cheeky Williams stayed in amongst the majestic Renaults. For various reasons, one of the rarest sights in Formula One racing is racing cars actually racing each other. The crowd likes it, but it makes team managers nervous. They would rather see their cars off on their own up at the front with nothing to worry about except pit signals. So it might have been about this time, for future reference, that it began occurring to the Brabham Joint Chiefs of Staff how much faster their cars would go initially if not full of such impedimenta as, say, petrol. But all that lay in the future. For now, the Brabhams were doing nicely enough. Everyone was doing nicely. It was a real race. When Piquet went past Anu, the prospective Mrs. Piquet liked it. Until lap 30, it was a triangular nail-biter between Villeneuve, Piquet and Rosberg. Piquet went past Rosberg and the whole of Brazil liked it. Piquet closed on Villeneuve and Brazil liked it even better. Then Rosberg passed Piquet and Brazil hated it. Piquet pulled back again past Rosberg and the Brazilians went berserk. Piquet was up with Villeneuve, they went insane. Villeneuve went into a fence, they were ecstatic. That left Piquet and Rosberg, with Rosberg taking the heat better than Piquet and a lot better than Patrese who briefly did immaculate three-point turns around an imaginary circuit about 50 feet in diameter, before dimly realizing that it was time to go in and have a nice lie down. Piquet, resting his head against the side of the cockpit to take the weight off his neck, somehow managed to hold off the bull-strong Rosberg, the man from a country no Brazilian has ever heard of, the man that the British media were already calling the Flying Finn. Rosberg's sudden rise to celebrity plunged Carlos Reutemann into a dark mood that was eventually to lead him back to Argentina and into oblivion. It was only last year that PK had pipped Carlos for the world championship. Now the world champion had finished first again, a result that was extremely popular with the population of Brazil, most of which was present. PK passed out on the victory dais and had to sit down to spurt the obligatory magnum of heavily promotional champagne. He would have felt even weaker had he known that the race would be taken away from him on a technicality, but more of that later. Onward to Los Angeles for the Long Beach Grand Prix, with the big question ringing in our ears. Is your car a heavy breather, or does it have a benzodrine inhaler? Long Beach is a tight street circuit where the turbos are meant to be at a disadvantage, but so were the Cosworths at Rio, so who knows? There was a lot of local atmosphere. Local people were politely curious about the imported cars. A customized roller skate? 
They retaliated with a specially built armoured car for Balestri to attend meetings in. The Formula One DeLorean. What is it that brings women to see men race cars? Here was a man who had the answer. Cars going around the track is not the big deal. Believing in God's the big deal. But the engines drowned him out. Lauda had merely finished fifth at Rio, as if he were a normal human being like you and me. But at Long Beach, he dominated practice quietly putting in the fastest laps right up until the final session, when De Cesaris in his Alfa Romeo noisily went faster than everybody, took the pole and led the race, getting quite a long way before he had his usual accident. This time a lot of other things had to happen first. There wasn't much room for overtaking, the circuit being a bit reminiscent of Monaco, minus the palace, the casino, the architecture, the yachts and the close proximity of France. Expensive engines revved hungrily in the hairpins. Frustration built up and some drivers began to wonder if there weren't other ways to pass the car in front apart from going around it. The Chaseris's Alpha teammate Giacomelli got past louder by the novel method of declining to brake for the next corner. He drop-kicked Arnu out of the race. Arnu hardly laughed at all. Lauda went after De Cesaris. De Cesaris had the advantage of youth. Lauda had the advantage of experience. Some say he had the advantage of brains. The Chaseris lined up to pass a back marker without realizing that his subtle maneuverings would leave Lauda a glimpse into the clear. To Lauda, that one chink of light was an open door. After 15 laps, he was past the Chaseris, leaving the young Italian no alternative but to have his standard crash later on. Villeneuve pressed on brilliantly, as did Rosberg, Turbo versus Cosworth. For several laps, the racing cars were racing. was lightning in the straights and custard in the corners, despite the theoretical aid of a sailplane rear wing providing extra something or other. Downforce, up thrust, advertising space, nobody knew. There was an interesting moment when Rosberg went past Villeneuve. The watching world, which doesn't know much about relative handling qualities, was left wondering whether the Williams wasn't faster than the Ferrari. If it wasn't, then maybe Rosberg was as good as Villeneuve. Villeneuve was very keen to prove that couldn't be right and put his foot down firmly. Villeneuve's pressure-packed driving finally had its inevitable result. But he found first gear again and recovered to arrive third, when we all finally found out what the rear wing was for. It was to get him disqualified under that special morale-busting official dispensation, which ensures that a driver must first lay his life on the line before being told that all his efforts are in vain. So Patrese was third, Rosberg was second, and Lauda was supreme, right back on top, a place he knows well. The San Marino Grand Prix was held at Imola in Italy, there being no room to hold a Grand Prix in San Marino unless it is contested on a tabletop with very small electric cars. 
except for the Dog of Tyrrells and a few teams with names like brands of orange juice. Imola was a non-Cosworth occasion, boycotted by the Foca teams because of FISA's retroactive decision to call the water tank wheeze illegal. This meant, among other things, that Piquet's win at Rio had been an optical illusion and that Rosberg hadn't come second. Prost Renault had actually won at Rio, even if, to the unaided eye of the average earthling, it had appeared to come third. At Imola, the Renaults were two of only 14 cars present, but the race was sensational anyway. The real story of the race was that the Renaults fell apart and the Ferraris didn't. The story took a while to unfold, however, and at the start, the lemon yellow cars were in front. Then the Ferraris got in amongst them, and Arnoux's car developed the sulks. The Ferraris went past Arnoux, and his car sprained a turbo in protest, gushing those characteristic gouts of flame, which the trained eye was learning to associate with a surge of disappointment in the Gallic engine room. The Ferraris swept on. They should have swept on as per team orders, with Villeneuve first and Peroni second. That's what the contract says, and common sense says the same, because a team leader is hired to win for his manufacturer and can't be expected to do it if he has to race his backup man as well. The late Ronnie Peterson once spent a whole season coming second to Mario Andretti when they were both driving for Lotus. Peterson was at least as fast as Andretti and would have been glad to prove it, but his signature meant more to him than glory. But that was another age. Peroni decided to have it out with Villeneuve. in telephonic communication with Commendatore Enzo Ferrari at Maranello, told Peroni to let Villeneuve through. Peroni didn't. He had a long think about whether he wanted to be first or second and decided he wanted to be first. The resulting scrap, with Villeneuve sometimes ahead but more often not, was very thrilling for the spectators but its effect on Villeneuve was unhealthy at the time, and to hindsight seems tragic. If he had managed to beat Peroni, things might have been different, but he didn't, so only Peroni finished the day with a light heart. Villeneuve declared his intention of not speaking to Peroni again for the rest of his life. The quarrel would have faded away with time, but alas, Villeneuve had no time. In the last qualifying session for the Belgian Grand Prix at Zolder, Villeneuve had one last chance to better Peroni's time. Villeneuve had often complained about the absurdity of trying for fast times on a crowded track with qualifying tyres which had only one quick lap in them, and the consequent temptation to keep the foot down when it should come up. And that was just what happened. Flat to the floor, he came up behind Jochen Maas, who moved one way to let him through when Villeneuve was moving the same way to get past. The little red car went up in the air, tore itself to pieces and threw Villeneuve away. He was a poet of a driver, a star of the sport, and his loss was a hard way to be reminded that the higher the excitement, the higher the price. The race went on, with the two Renaults once again at the front and the standard pile-up happening at the rear. The Ferraris had been withdrawn as a mark of respect for Villeneuve, but the Brabhams were back at school after playing hooky from Imola, during which time they had once again switched engines and turned back into being turbos. Rosberg, in the brand-new Williams FW08, got right up behind Arnoux's Renault. 
Since the new Williams was by the team's own confession only half set up, it looked like a whole new lease of life for the Cosworths. Rosberg's name was beginning to bulk as large as his body. Rosberg went past Arnu, sick with chagrin. The Renaults ritually fell to pieces. Turbos lying conked out all over the landscape, surely it was in the bag for Rosberg. It would have been a fabulous first for the Flying Finn and the wickedly fast Williams FW08. Neither of them had yet won a Grand Prix. But far back, John Watson had decided that he liked the feel of his tyres. They were sticking to the track in a very reassuring manner. He caught up with his teammate Lauda. He stayed very close to his teammate Lauda, who sensibly realised that Watson had better wheels on the day. He went past his teammate Lauda. One by one, he went past nearly everybody. While the Brabhams were joining the Renaults in the Turbo Boneyard. It was the beginning of a whole new John Watson technique called winning from the back. All marvelled, including, at the last moment, Rosberg, because Watson went past him too. Rosberg had shaved his tyres bald to getting ahead of Lauda, and there just wasn't enough of them left to shut Watson out. So Watson went by to a popular win. It did something to take away the sadness of Villeneuve's death. Lauda was disqualified from third place because his car was three pounds underweight, which paid him back for daring to turn up at Imola and tell all concerned that politics were killing a great sport. Next stop, Monaco where as yet nobody could guess that Princess Grace was in the last year of her rule. Monaco is a sort of long beach, minus the Queen Mary, but plus everything else. Bjorn Borg sleeps there between tournaments, wearing his headband in bed and waking up occasionally when one of his rackets explodes with the tension. Monaco is Toyland, but there has to be somewhere for toys to go. As a gesture to the past, the cars of old did their stuff. Ferrari, Bugatti, Maserati. Just imagine, most of them used to have engines in the front, a seat instead of a bed, and no wings. Not like cars at all. hands in a black Bugatti in the days when you could see the driver's arms. None of that now. As always, the race started impressively, with no suggestion that it was going to be choreographed in its later stages by Jacques Tati, his last great comedy before taking a final bow. Arnoux's Renault led away, with Giacomelli and Patrese heading a big queue to watch the Frenchman pull out an even bigger lead. Was this part of a new Renault tactic to build up such a thick cushion that there would be time to redesign the car after it disintegrated? On the balconies, learned opinion was divided.
on and on went the flying Anu, with Prost moving up inexorably to second place. For a full 15 laps, the Renaults were so dominant it was daunting. What had gone right? And then Anu gave us the reassurance that everything was normal. Frost went by into first place, warming himself with the thought that his beloved teammate was walking safely back to the hotel for a hot bath and a rub down. Frost was more than capable of doing the whole thing on his own. The nearest car behind his was so far back it was ahead of him. Out over the mountains, a small rainstorm was gathering, but that was no reason to lift the delicately sandaled Gallic foot. A flag marshal either tried to tell Frost about the possibility of rain, or else was merely pointing to a passing airliner belonging to Nicky Lauda. It was dry in the tunnel, but outside the sun was veiled elegantly by French rain. Perhaps Prost should have slowed down. Perhaps not. He should have slowed down. He had got all the way to lap 74, which was a high proportion of the 76 laps required, but not quite high enough. Prost walked home again while Patrese's Brabham took the lead. Patrese, looking as if the race was his, forged on with only two laps to go. In the Brabham bunker, they were already tying an Italian tricolour ribbon on Patrese's medal, the OBE, the Order of Bernie Eccleston. It was going to be the first ever Grand Prix victory for the Parmalat-fed boy from Padua. But at Station Hairpin, he mistakenly decided to try finishing the race going backwards. That left Peroni in the lead, going slowly because of the wet track, and not just because the nose of the Ferrari had fallen off. Going very slowly because of the wet track. Going inexplicably slowly, even if the track had been a canal. One lap from the end, he rolled to a stop, having fallen victim to that obscure mechanical malaise known to the Italian designers as mancanza di benzina, or absence of fuel. The chaser has parked on a zebra crossing and went looking for a filling station. Daly was also out. That left the position of first place open for practically anyone who could get his engine started. Patrese, stalled at the hairpin, rolled down to the harbour front, bump started, put in a gradual last lap and won. The crowd cheered as if it all made sense. Crazy was so pleased he gave the glum Peroni a lift home, thus proving that the Brabham is not only very fast, but strong enough to carry two people in addition to all the advertising. If the black Bugatti had been in the race, it would probably have finished first, but as things were, the Brabhams had something to compensate them for PK's gearbox, which fell to bits on lap 49. The world champion was getting very short of points, even if the season still had a long way to go. The Grand Prix Circus went back across the Atlantic to Detroit, a town where imported automobiles aren't always a welcome sight. But Formula One cars don't threaten anyone's job, so the puzzled spectators were all smiles. I think it's nice. I think it's great for the city of Detroit, and the interruption I think is well worth it. Fantastic. I think it's all right. I think Detroit needs something like that. I think it's really exciting. Have you ever seen uh, sort of racing before? No. You're going to be here on Sunday? No. <laughs> I believe we build the best cars in the world here, and what better place to have a race than the Motor City? The circuit for Detroit's first Grand Prix wasn't even finished, hence no practice. The drivers did a lot of being just one of the boys and stuff like that. After a grand total of two and a half minutes practice, the grid order was decided by color of hair. When the race finally got underway, the drivers, with Prost first and Rosberg and the Chaseris on his tail, were heading into the unknown, so a minor shunt was only to be expected.
Patrese, perhaps still tasting the champagne from Monaco, went off. A fire marshal covered a flag marshal with foam. The flag marshal wiped his eyes with a red flag and the race stopped for an hour. Ample time for all the major teams to rebuild their cars. After the restart, an hour later, Frost and Rosberg were away again. Turbo versus Cosworth at sea level. the Renault died of shame. Cross must have missed a gear when he saw Rosberg make a U-turn down the escape road. But the real news was Watson, who was once again doing his top gear from the rear number, this time from an impossible 18th place on the grid, which was practically the same as starting the race in England. He went past Giacomelli, and Giacomelli disposed of himself pressing the wrong pedal. He climbed through the field until there were three cars separating him from a crack at the leader. Loud as McLaren, Chivas, Ligier, and Peroni's Ferrari. In a single lap, the lap of the gods, one by one he nailed them all. left only Rosberg in front and eventually the inspired Watson gathered him in too. Watson's finely tuned philosophical spirit should have been shaken to jelly by the Detroit track but this year Hamlet was turning into Fortinbras or to put it another way having got used to losing he was now getting used to winning. So Watty was on the victory dais for the second time in three races and leading the world championship. A big step in his one-man crusade to prove that nice guys can finish first. Montreal wasn't far away, but the track, now renamed the Circuit Villeneuve, was a different matter. It was turbo heaven. Even the air was right. It was a chill day and turbos loved the cool. Alas, the first lap saw young Riccardo Paletti die in his Ocella, which ran Peroni's stall Ferrari from behind at 100 miles per hour plus. All you can say is that the danger is part of it and that there is truth in danger. Not all of the truth, but some of it, and that you can't stop men looking for it. But Paletti came to the end of his search awfully early. The car was bung full of juice. Perhaps they should have doused it before they touched it. Saying what should have happened is a way of keeping busy while you watch helpless.
Peroni, being a professional driver, got a new car and led the race when it restarted two hours later. But it was too much to expect that a car which hadn't been dialed in could stay out there in front for long. Eventually, Peroni was obliged to yield the lead. Arnu was once again up front. Giacomelli and Mansell stopped to exchange names and addresses, while the rest of the field chased the Renaults. But Piquet was up there with them. All Piquet had to do was wait. The Brabham BMW that hadn't even reached the race in Detroit was now going very fast indeed. The only question was whether it would last. The same question did not arise in the case of the Renaults, since it was well known that they wouldn't. Our news stayed close to Piquet, and for a while it looked just as if they were racing, but it couldn't last. Our news spun out and left Piquet all alone. Arnoux showed the marshals how to push his car, saying things in the French language, which they kindly pretended not to understand. Far away and a long way back, Prost must have heard him and blew a turbo as a mark of respect. That left the two Brabhams well ahead, and behind them, everybody else was running out of petrol again. The Chaseris was still looking for a filling station. Daly down tools in sympathy. PK came in first, but through a long traffic jam of parked racing cars, John Watson arrived to take third place and look at least as much like the next world champion as the current world champion did. Holland. A very flat country, Holland is served by various slow means of transport. Here are some boats. Here are some trams. Here is a small boy. Here is a big girl. Everything conspired to make the drivers feel wanted. Unless the wind blows the sand off the dunes and in front of the air scoops, Zandvoort favors the turbos. But for any kind of car at all, long straights and sweet curves give the driver a chance to use the upper gears in the box and stretch his weary leg. Once again, the Renaults qualified firmly first and second. It was a pity that the actual race had to come along and spoil it all. As the Renaults got away, Peroni's Ferrari was right up behind them, and this time it was a car he'd practiced in. Frost was in front and Arnoux was behind him, but then Peroni got in between, which was not in the French script. For a while, Peroni had been Ferrari number one with no number two, but in this race, he was joined for the first time by Patrick Tombe, who had left Formula One in disgust, but come back again at the Commendatore's dulcet call. With Arnoux disposed of, it was just Peroni behind Frost, Then it was just Peroni in front of Prost. The Renaults dropped back discouraged. Meanwhile, Rosberg came steaming up to chase Tom Bay. This wasn't in anybody's script, because the Williams is not a turbo car. 
But Rosberg was so fired up by being dubbed the Flying Finn that he was very hard to reason with. Piquet also had the legs of the Renaults coming up behind them as fast as Peroni was going away in front of them. Piquet went very rapidly past Arnoux which gave you the idea that the BMW engine might be even more powerful than the Renault. Peroni was still out in front, but there was a lot happening behind him. Anu's Renault had fallen ill. Not content with falling ill, it fell apart. Another case of a Renault going tricycle, it was a giant shunt that Anu was lucky to walk away from. The Renaults, being linked as always in psychic sympathy like a loving couple, Prost's car grew melancholy and crept home. Rosberg chased Piquet. Alvaretto mowed the lawn. And rejoined the race in time to get in Piquet's way. Piquet almost lost second place trying to get past Alvaretto. That done, Piquet, with the new big BMW engine that outruns Renault's and lasts longer too, kept going after Peroni, but there was no keeping DDA away from the Champagne this time. Rosberg had to be content with third but looked good in the points. Lauda was a mere fourth and Watson, let down by his tyres, was seventh, although still number one in the championship, one point ahead of Peroni. But after nine of the 16 races, Watson's lead had been almost eaten up, and Peroni looked all set for a turbo charge. Rosberg was third, but surely a rank outsider. Piquet was on the dais, but almost nowhere in the points, so his reign as champion must have felt a bit like Edward VIII's as king. While the red arrows did their thing all over a clear sky, philosophers wrestled with the question, could Watson do it twice in the British Grand Prix? Doing it once was already something, because at Brands Hatch you have to run two races in the one afternoon. The first race is from the start to the first corner on a track too narrow to hold all the cars. If you survive that, you get a chance to start the second race from the first corner to the finish. Bernie Eccleston came down after successfully negotiating with the man upstairs for a fine afternoon. He had to thread his way through an assortment of aircraft, including a biplane flown by Balestri who was crop dusting the crowd with nerve gas. A hospital plane flew in to pick up the survivors. warm-up lap except pole sitter Rosberg, who had already used up his first engine and now found that the second engine wouldn't go either. While the others all disappeared over the hill, Rosberg's mechanics gave his engine mouth to mouth. Rosberg's engine at last fired, 
he had to chase the rest of them flat out around to the start line and arrived mouthing four letter words in Finnish just in time for the green light. Only he was at the back of the field instead of where he belonged, at the front. Actually, it was a mixed blessing being at the front, as Patrese demonstrated. The obligatory brand green light a go-go mass shunt was milder than usual, but expensive enough. Having inherited pole position by default, Patrese promptly stalled. Peroni got around him, but Arnu rammed him in the gearbox, scratched two turbos. Watson slalomed around the outside, but he was now near the end of the field. Two laps later, some slow cars muck Watson about by running into each other and having to be fumigated. Watson spun off to avoid the uproar and walked home, an activity which earns no points. Brabham had a big plan for a pit stop halfway so the PK could build up a huge lead at the start with a light load. As PK led the race, Tambe led Rosberg, who was supposed to be at the back of the field but wasn't. The Brabham master plan went wrong when PK's fuel injection packed up after only nine laps. That let the cunningly lurking Lauda through into first place, which he knew how to keep. Having won the British Grand Prix before, he just slotted the car into the groove in the track and dreamed of bigger and better airliners. Which left only two big stories in the race. The first story was a romance, the fabulous tale of the Tolman, driven by Derek Warwick. Before Zandvoort, the Tolman had been called a car for David Coleman, or a turbo engine truck. But at Brands, it suddenly went far better than any car with a 12-ton lead chassis has a right to. And Warwick had his first taste since Formula 3 of how it feels to be a front runner. It can only last until a cast iron cotter pin gave way. But nothing could change the historical fact that Peroni's Ferrari had been decisively seen off by a car with the power to weight ratio of the Barbican Art Centre. Lauda was first, and Warwick was second, but one of them was fantasizing. The second story was the realistic one. It was the story of Lauda winning by sheer class. He even had enough energy left over from being glad to feel sad that the McLaren Porsche Turbo wasn't ready because Brands was going to be the last race where the Cosworth had a chance, or so the theory went. Certainly things were going dark for Watson. Rosberg ran out of fuel pressure and slipped to fourth place in the championship behind the shyly unretiring Lauda. This apparently dull stretch of road is the Paul Ricard circuit. If it bores you, the Mediterranean is nearby. If the Mediterranean bores you, you can lie face down on the beach. If you lie face up, you can see things like this or these. If that doesn't interest you, here's another kind of thrill. Further down the beach, even less is happening. This area needed something, and since the French A-bomb was already being tested somewhere else, the only thing to do was build a motor racing circuit. Paul Ricard two years previously, Alan Jones creamed the Ligiers to his own intense satisfaction. This year the French intended to win. There were rumours of a plan to disqualify any driver who was not a French citizen driving a Renault, but this plan was upstaged by the even more unlikely plan of the Brabham team to try the halfway pit stop all over again. The Renaults plus one Ferrari led away, but were well aware, as who was not, that the Brabhams would soon go by, having left half their fuel at the pits to be collected later. The French crowd had paid good French francs to see a French car driven by a French driver in the lead on a French circuit, but would have been happier if no other cars had been appearing on the same day. This especially applied to the Brabhams, who had the nerve, on the second lap, to exploit the advantage conferred on them by the master plan of the perfidious Eccleston. Patrese went past the Renaults first, then Piquet went past them as well, so that by lap five it was two Brabhams, two Renaults, two Ferraris, the top turbo formation dancing team. But although Piquet probably quite liked the idea of getting past Patrese, it happened in unfortunate circumstances, with Patrese's car going very slowly, as if it wanted to do something. 
Yes, it wanted to burst into flames. PK raced on while his teammate tried to find out how far you can drive a bonfire. A perilous challenge. But taking that kind of risk is a driver's job. The same doesn't necessarily apply to the spectators, who took it with admirable calm when Baldi's arrows boosted Jochen Mass's march into the crowd upside down and on fire. The number of people killed was zero, which is about three or four hundred fewer than it might have been. While Baldi did a flat spin through the catch fencing, Mass, further up the enclosure, unbuckled, dropped out and walked away. Back on the track, Piquet raced on towards the beckoning halfway mark, key point in Brabham's dazzling new scheme. Alas, Piquet's Brabham copycatted Patrese's and blew up. The smoke wasn't quite as dense, but he was still a long way from the famous mid-distance pit stop, which some of us were beginning to doubt we would live to see. From then on, it was a French benefit, with the two pretty yellow cars working perfectly, as if all concerned in the Renault team had agreed, for one day only, to put all the nuts on the right bolts. The crowd was reconfirmed in its belief that God was French. The only fight left in the race was between Rosberg and Alboreto, and they were coming fifth and sixth, which from the French viewpoint wasn't as good as them coming seventh and eighth, or coming to pieces, but wasn't bad. Not even Lauda was on the same lap as the leaders. The only false note was struck by Arnoux, who was supposed to come second, as per contract. He decided to come first instead, to the extreme annoyance of Prost, but Arnoux was too far ahead to see the white of Prost's lips. So Peroni still led the world championship from Watson, who hadn't scored for three races. But Prost was ahead of Lauda and Rosberg, and this time the champagne was popped by the people who invented the stuff. German Grand Prix was at Hockenheim, which is near Heidelberg. Or if you like dueling scars better than racing cars, Heidelberg is near Hockenheim. It's pretty much of a toss-up. Hockenheim is a Teutonic test track for the Titanic turbos. The quickest normally aspirated cars were a breathless two seconds down on any turbo except the Tolman, but during practice, the rain did its best to even things out. It turned the cars into hydrofoils and came very close to killing Peroni, who had a crash just like Villeneuve's. His injuries, especially to his right leg, were fearsome, and the race started minus its fastest qualifier, although some light was shed through the overcast by the welcome news that his injuries weren't as terminal as had at first been thought. The sport depends on its star drivers. Cars by themselves are short of character, although the Renaults always try to keep you guessing like the kind of woman who says yes every second time. At home, they had kept going until the end. Could they do it here? Arnoux led Prost away, but almost immediately Piquet's Brabham BMW was in amongst them, since once again the Brabham grand plan for a fast first half plus mid-race moratorium was in operation. All the Brabhams had to do was get there, and they would be rewarded by fresh fuel from the refrigerator and hot tires from the oven. Piquet got in front of Arnoux, and the plan looked as if it might work for once, for him at least, although there was still a long way to go until half-time. A 
after Fuoco Trese, the pit stop came early because of a cooked piston. So that left PK, only one man for the big plan. PK was approaching the first ever halfway halt for cool fuel. Nothing could go wrong. Everything had been foreseen, except the awkward presence of Salazar in the run-up to the new Mickey Mouse Ostkurva chicane. Salazar was supposed to drop back, but apparently had not read the stage directions. Piquet was calm, however. He greeted Salazar affectionately. Piquet and Salazar go to karate class together, and here was a chance to practice a few routines. This could be the high point of Salazar's career, so let's see it again. Bernie Eccleston, plugged into the whole world by personal radio, probably heard the news from Japan. The Brabham mechanics went back to the dressing room. Town Bay powered on in the lead, but the tension had evaporated. Now there would have to be another race before we could finally discover that the Brabham could go all the way half full after going halfway half empty. The feet had got the toll ball going again after a miserable season. But all overcome at having passed two cars at once, Lafitte slid off. More seriously, from the championship angle, Watson's long grind from behind came to an end. Tom Bay, whose life was turning into a dream, won his first Grand Prix. Rosberg came third, scoring four valuable points. Tom Bay took the flag for Ferrari. Arnoux finished ahead of Rosberg, but was behind him in the championship. The two turbos waved to the crowd, while Watson was still looking for the hole his points had drained out of. So Tom Bay liked Formula One after all. His teammate Peroni still theoretically led the championship, but wouldn't be racing anymore this year. So that meant it was Watson and then Rosberg. The guys who had no chance were still coming first and second. South to Austria and the Österreich ring, the fastest circuit in the calendar, where the sun came out and ruminating cows asked themselves the question, could any of the allegedly invincible turbos hold together long enough to make its driver champion of the world? Or could a normally aspirated human being take all? The outside chance that it might be louder was enough to bring the locals flocking. But when the clamor of the 150 miles per hour practice laps died down, there was no getting around the fact that the first five qualifiers were all turbos. The Italian Air Force was there on a goodwill mission. Bernie came back from a meeting with Balestri, and there was almost a collision. O-ring did a bit of a brand hatch at the start, with both alphas being instantly eliminated. At the normal speed of the human eyeball, it was hard to tell which bit belonged to which car. All you could be certain of was that Giacomelli and De Cesaris had played havoc with each other's no-claims bonus. While PK and Patrese screamed off into the distance, the Austrian television service went back for another lingering look at the mass destruction. It turned out that De Cesaris had taken immense trouble to get all the way across the track in order to ram his teammate. Why this should have been so, nobody knew. While the Alphas were being put back together so they could be thrown away, Piquet led Patrese, and the big plan was going like a military operation. Although nobody knew which military operation. It might have been Arnhem. The two Renaults were behind the two Brabhams after Tambay punched a tire. It was tough on Tambay. It was tougher on Alboreto, who had to walk home. Tambay got back to the pits for a new tyre and was able to go on. Patrese was now in the lead. Piquet was going backwards because of blistered tyres, so his half of the big plan misfired.
But for Patrese, the magic moment had arrived. The Brabham mechanics were out of their dressing room and in position. Patrese came in for the first planned pit stop since the days when Fangio won the 1957 German Grand Prix with an extended interval for a drink and a smoke. Patrese was up on the jacks for a grand total of 14 seconds while the cool fuel was pumped in under pressure and the crispy fried slicks Gas Mark 7 were put on with oven gloves. Then he was out again. The first successful split raised pit pause in modern history. Was this the shape of things to come? If so, it would have to include what happened to Patrese next. He was still in the lead according to the plan, but according to the plan, Frost was supposed to fade away on those dreary old tires that had spent half the race going around in circles instead of baking gently in the stove. But... Or, to put it another way, but... The BT-50 blew its engine, and with locked back wheels frisbeed towards the crowd, which the Lord in his wisdom had placed on a hill with a little grass ha-ha at ground level, just big enough to stop a racing car going sideways out of control. The Tracy had a lot of luck, so did a lot of spectators, including the kind of girl who has to get into trouble before she believes that you can get pregnant standing up. Frost Torreno took over the lead while Patrese walked home. De Angelus in the Lotus was doing amazingly well, right up behind the Renault, which after a few tours duly collapsed under the responsibility, signaling defeat with the now standard tons of flame. Frost prepared for yet another long walk. Meanwhile, De Angelis drove on like a man in a dream, but with Rosberg looming in his mirrors. For the few remaining laps, De Angelis coped with fuel starvation while Rosberg got closer and closer. Rosberg, who must have been wondering all season just what he had to do to win a race, got as close as he could possibly go while still coming second. It was the ideal finish, the one that hardly ever happens. For De Angelis, it was a totally unexpected, yet richly merited first victory in a Grand Prix. But in the championship, before you got to De Angelis, it was Rosberg, Watson, Lauda and Frost. In the age of the turbo, the first two cars were still breathing ordinary air, just like people. The Swiss Grand Prix was held at Dijon in France, forecasting the age when the Tibetan Grand Prix will be held in Tasmania. But although Dijon boasts the bloodiest-minded officials in the whole Formula One firmament, it has the compensation of being situated in that part of France where they manufacture Burgundy. The louder fans had unrolled their old battle banners, but there was also a sizable Rosberg rooting section who had trekked in from Finland with barely enough time to construct their pro-KK placards. So sudden had been the rise to world fame of their new national hero. Could KK do it? Surely Watson couldn't. Was it true that the Brabham's plan to turn around halfway and come back in the opposite direction? And how come these questions had even arisen when the turbos were supposed to be unbeatable? The laid-back louder let it all go by. For the nth time, the two Renaults were up there like the Everly brothers with Arnu secure in the knowledge that he would be driving for Ferrari next year, so it didn't really matter so much if the somewhat alienated Renault mechanics had forgotten to screw the car together. After all, they never did anyway. There were no Ferraris because Tambe had gone home with a compressed neck nerve, a pleasure made possible by those unique rules of modern Grand Prix racing, which ensure that all road shock will be transmitted directly to the driver's spine. 
The Brabham's, with Lauda getting in between them, ran very reliably, but not especially fast, the reverse of their usual priorities. Prost took the lead from Arnoux. Arnoux went backwards until Piquet went past him. Piquet was once again scheduled to make the now notorious half-time hot tyre halt, even if Patrese wasn't, so the big plan was still at least 50% operative. Watson came in for tyres and skirts and his chances seemed to vanish. Piquet, to the great excitement of the pensive planet, for the second time in history made it all the way to the big plan central Cezura. It all happened in a flash. The Brabham drum majorettes did the dance of the pneumatic wrench. And out went Piquet, theoretically with renewed energy. Watson went past him, two laps behind. But a lot of other people were in front. Not just the Renaults, but Rosberg and Lauda, who were held up for a bad quarter of an hour by De Cesaris, not wanting to be lapped. Some say that the Chaseris is a French secret agent, others that he is an incurable featherhead, but none deny that he makes his presence felt. Finally, Rosberg charged away even from Lauda. The Chaseris had spun off in order to get in front of Rosberg twice, but by now, Rosberg was after the Renaults, and the Chasers was just part of the landscape. Rosberg's Williams went past our news Renault. The Chaseris somehow managed to include himself in the party, and Rosberg brandished his gearbox angrily. Our news Renault was so shocked it came into the pits for more fuel before going out again to die of scrambled electronics in the injection system. It was hard on Arnoux, but no easier on Prost, because with only one lap to victory, he had Rosberg filling his mirrors like von Richthofen. The Renault was faster in the straights, but Rosberg was making straights out of the curves. The will found the means, and Rosberg got through. There was nothing Prost or any other Frenchman could do, even though the man with the chequered flag, who had considered waving it two laps early on Prost's behalf, now considered putting it out a few laps late in case Prost caught up again. But Rosberg kept on going flat out until he saw the flag. When in France, you must do as Jonesy did. One hand on your wallet, the other on your crotch. Keep smiling, but keep going. So it was the big finish finish. Rosberg had won his first Grand Prix and probably the whole championship along with it. With Peroni out, Prost was effectively second, 11 points down, and Lauda and Watson equal third behind Prost. There was no champagne because the Williams team is backed by Arabs. Italy and the Ferrari assembly shop. Race fans gather to pray for the destruction of the opposing teams. Children bribe pigeons to evacuate on the heads of opposing teams. Fans draw lots for the privilege of running onto the track after the Ferraris have won in order to be killed by opposing cars which have not yet finished. Policemen discuss which opposing team driver should be arrested for speeding. At Monza, it was turbo time again. And the only surprise was that the pole sitter was ex-world champion Mario Andretti, the nearest thing Ferraris could find to an Italian driver. Bernie got back just in time from selling the Vatican Grand Prix to the Pope. Balestri's Air Force tried to cut him off. But with the Pope in his pocket, Bernie had that extra something. And the official battle continued overhead. 
The Italian Tifosi either didn't realize that Andretti is an American or else didn't care. They turned up in impressive numbers to watch Ferrari win, which is the only thing that really matters to them. Away went the six turbos, with Piquet in the lead. the occasional small fracas among the minor men, but otherwise the pattern of the race was clear. The turbos were going to race each other until they fell apart. Tambay was in the lead, which wasn't as good as Andretti being in the lead from the Italian viewpoint, but was almost as good. But then the Italians had to cope with the unspeakable sight of a yellow car going past a red one. Later on, Patrese also got past Tambay and crowded Arnu. For the Italians, the disaster was unmitigated. It didn't help when one of their O-sellers shed a wheel for lightness and redrew the course by cutting out one of the chicanes. The Brabhams went out with a duff clutch each, and Watson started his famous burn from the stern. At the front, the Renaults were racing the Ferraris. Andretti, plagued with a sticky throttle, dropped back, but Tambay was holding second place and was immediately elected an honorary Italian by the Tifosi. Rosberg did the burst from behind, but wasn't helped by a missing rear wing, which turned the Williams into a Volkswagen. Frost was still contesting second place when Rosberg went in for a new tailplane. Frost retired with laryngitis in the fuel injection to the rapturous cheers of the sportsmanlike Italians. left our new. Our new finally ran out the winner, but the Italian crowd decided not to lynch him because he would be driving for Ferrari next year. So they poured onto the track in their usual attempt to be mown down in great numbers by cars that had not yet finished the race. An Italian sacrificial ceremony, which it is said that not even the Japanese fully understand. was first on the dais, but he was far back in the points. The big news was who was almost on the dais. Watson, after a fine drive against the odds, had come in fourth, thus putting himself only nine points behind Rosberg. Suppose Watty came first in Las Vegas, and Rosberg came nowhere at all. Or to put it the other way around, all that Rosberg had to do was come fifth in Las Vegas, whereas if Watson didn't win, he wouldn't be world champion. Thank <laughs> you.
Both Watson and Rosberg had a lot to think about as they flew back across the Atlantic to be confronted by the large hole in the desert to which at one point water has been added in order to form Las Vegas. If it was a long shot, Las Vegas was just the place to watch it come in. Superficially devoted to games of chance, Vegas is actually more predictable than Moscow. Nothing happens there except a steady mechanical subtracting of money from the punters. It makes a nice change to have a genuinely unpredictable event in which the house and the gamblers all start even. Even the Turbos and the Cosworths were starting even because Caesars Palace car park offers little in the way of long straights and all too much in terms of a pain in the driver's neck. Stamina counts at Las Vegas, especially when it's hot, and it was very. The threat of rain having been staved off at the last minute by yet another high-level initiative from Bernie. Should have been too hot for the turbos, but on the green light, Frost led Arnu in a running dogfight that quickly pulled away from the rest of the field. Alboreto's Tyrrell was third, going unexpectedly fast. But with all eyes on the needle match up front, it was easy to miss the progress of Watson, who was doing his biggest attack from the back number yet. From ninth place on the grid, he sank back even further in order to make sure he was near the rear before starting to move forward. Watson went past a lot of people before he caught Rosberg, who realized that Watson might very well win in this mood, in which case the smart place for Rosberg would be a nice safe fifth. But Tracy dropped out as part of some big plan to create a diversion. Alboreto's licorice green stove enamel Tyrrell was embarrassingly close behind our news Renault. Watson charged on in search of the impossible, which was looking more possible all the time. Hobbled by a sulking cylinder, Arnu hid in the pits from Alboreto and dreamed of his first Ferrari. Andretti's Ferrari had Rosberg up its tail and developed a rectal fissure in the rear suspension. The resulting slide gave Andretti just time to catch the mid-afternoon plane to Michigan and leave Town Bay to collect the Constructors' Championship. Rosberg resisted the impulse to climb out every few hundred yards and check the tire pressures. The Angelus's Lotus converted itself into a North Sea oil rig. Brit oil. The new lightweight Tolman was only 11 tons instead of 12 and spun off as a consequence. And all the time, Alboreto closed on Frost. Alboreto passed Frost, a move simply bound to make the Renault feel ill. Alboreto kept running first and Rosberg fifth, which was all either of them needed. Watson came second to Alboreto and it was just, but only just, not enough. Alboreto, who nobody ever guessed would be there, was there in first place. The 
fifth place man, to the confusion of the watching Americans, shook his fist in the air as if he had won everything. And so the Grand Prix year of 1982 ended on the victory dais at Vegas. Nobody really knew who Alboreto was, except that he had arrived. The Americans were politely enthusiastic, as if they understood it all. Watson thought about what might have been, although what had been was amazing enough. The three of them had been joined by Diana Ross. They were the Supremes, live in Las Vegas. And that's what the champagne really means. It means alive. This year, the rules and the cars had hurt too many people. For that bitter taste in the mouth, you needed golden bubbles. What would happen next year? Would there be solid steel tires, an asbestos Renault, a Brabham running on liquid dynamite with a pit stop every lap so that Bernie could slap on more advertisements? Had Balestri really been entered in the Miss World contest? The rumors flew. But nothing could diminish the finish finish. K.K. Rosberg was the moustache of the moment. K.K., you and Michael Nelson. Yeah, 